Good morning, Chris. Good morning, Richard. How are you? I'm wonderful. We uh, we spent some time together this week at the uh, Imagination in Action conference here in Boston, uh, hosted by John Warner and the MIT Media Lab. Lots of interesting human beings talking about lots of interesting stuff. Why don't we start there? Uh, you were on stage, you were on a panel, and you had an opportunity to do a lightning talk as well. Uh, why don't you let us know what uh, what that was all about? Yeah, um, and first of all, it was great being back in Boston. Um, the weather was amazing. A little bit too cold for my liking, but still seeing <laughs> the flowers blooming, seeing the people and the energy. Of course, getting a chance to hang out with you is always amazing. So I was excited about that. Yeah, it's good. The, the conference, I think John did an amazing job putting it together, bringing in so many different thinkers and leaders and academics and businesses that are all looking to leverage AI and ask questions about best practices and safety and the customer experience. And my talk, it's a TED-like style talk. So if you think of the 15-minute TED Talks, it's called a lightning talk. And it was around the topic of AI literacy and why that's so important for you as an individual, for you as a business, and for us as a society. So it's going to be recorded. I think it's going to be featured on the Forbes website. Um, so that's something that we're going to be sharing with the community. Yeah, I got a, I got an interesting question about that, is that in uh, over the last week, I actually I Googled, what is AI literacy? And uh, the results were actually quite ambiguous. <laughs> in fact, one answer I got from Google was, there is no clear definition as to what AI literacy is. So uh, we might be in the category creation space here, or we might just be at the leading edge of a conversation. Exactly. And, and it's, it's great because I think we've seen it applied. We've seen literacy applied to different domains like health and finance. And right now we're at that inflection point where we do need to start defining it for AI and what that means for, for businesses especially. Yeah. And then uh, I was present for your panel conversation. Essentially, the point of this panel was to consider what the customer experience is, or uh, to use a more derogatory term, a user experience. <laughs> but essentially, these constituents that are uh, making use of AI and how that's employed in the products that we make. You and I are both product creators. So uh, tell us a little bit about that conversation that you had. Sure. It was a, a fantastic panel. It was hosted by Lindsay from Flybits and my co-panelists were Joan and Eric. And we got a chance to explore it both from the B2C side and also the B2B side. Some of the, the interesting takeaway points that I tried to hammer home, one was establishing trust with your customer. And the fact that trust takes time to build and it's going to evolve along with the journey. But I also highlighted the fact that the customer is changing, right? We are evolving just as AI is. And mm -hmm. so it's going to be a dynamic experience that business will need to think through. And so I, I think it was a fantastic panel. We had great questions and I'm looking forward to seeing that released also. Yeah, one of the things that comes to mind is that as a lot of frustrations and fear emerge from the product creation space, designers, engineers, product people, marketers, all worried about the future of their jobs, what we're actually seeing is those jobs are becoming even more important because as yeah. AI evolves, so are human beings. Mm -hmm. Our ability to be aware of these changes, our ability to adapt to these changes, and the context in which we need to adjust ourselves for these things to be either useful or harmful becomes a lot more interesting. And if you're a user experience person, if you're creating products, if you're designing products, if you're engineering products, there's never been a better time to be a human because uh, it's really, really hard to figure out what that dynamic will be, both in the current sense of the, of the of that understanding of like what's going on, but also in the predictive sense of like, well, what will happen? Exactly, exactly. And so overall, I, I'm super excited to, to get these recordings hopefully out to the community. But if not, maybe that's something that we can do on a podcast, just kind of talk through our perspective, what we're seeing in the, the marketplace but also our thoughts on how businesses can do this strategically. I like that. Um, one of the other things that you mentioned quite some time ago, actually last year, you said that 2024 would be the year of robotics. <laughs> and this happens to be the case. We've seen a lot of changes in that space. Uh, talk us through some of the big news that happened this week about robotics. 
again, Boston based as well, right? <laughs> Yeah, so so I, I think it's just so exciting when you look at this transition from AI on a screen in simulated environments in a chatbot to embodied AI. When we say embodied AI, we're talking about intelligent systems that can interact and learn with the physical world, right? Right now, an AI model like a chat GPT, it's pre-trained and then it's simply on your computer, you're talking to it, but it's not seeing the real world as we are, and it can't learn as we are. And so as we look to move towards artificial general intelligence, embodied AI systems are going to be super important. If you think of a child and just them interacting with the world and learning and getting that continuous feedback, our hope is that AI systems will also be able to get that consistent data coming in that they can learn and rely and get better context. And so there were two big stories this week. The first is from a company called Menti Robotics. And the co-founder of Menti was actually the co-founder of AI21. And so pretty renowned. And they're building a general purpose bipedal robot. And I'll stop here and establish some questions and context, right? I've always asked, why humanoid robots? Why is What is this obsession with building robots that look like humans? Is it that we're just that vain? And the, the responses that you'll hear from a lot of the leaders at these companies is, well, is because our world is designed for humans, right? And so rather than building a new type of design for a robot where they'll need to then solve all of those problems like stairs and things that humans would normally do, if you simply mimic a human design, then you can embed them in factories and in homes, and they can simply assist and help with labor, which is an increasing problem within our society. And so if, if, you're, if you're ever wondering why so many companies are focused on solving androids, human-like robots, that, that's usually the argument that you'll get. But with Menti, they're saying this is an AI-first robot, and that means that Within the technologies that they're using on the inside, they're using transformer technologies, which is what you'll see in a lot of the AI models today. And that allows the robot to basically understand and interpret and communicate in natural language. So you can talk to the robot, the robot can talk to you. And you have seen that also come out of OpenAI with their partnership with Figure. They're going to be bringing their GPT models into the robots. But it also allowed the robots to think through and to plan steps to complete a task. Um, it's still early days for them. They plan to release their first models in production, I believe, in 2025. However, the demos that they showed were really impressive. They were able to just talk to the robot and the robot was able to plan and execute accordingly. So definitely an interesting story to check out. Yeah, I have a, um, a question on that. Uh, recently listening to Cal Newport, who is a um, computer science professor over at Georgetown, talking about uh, the differences between LLMs and potentially other models. And what we're seeing, of course, is that LLMs are really good at learning. They're really good at understanding existing information, but they're really not good at planning and prediction. Right? They're, it's very difficult for them to figure out, for instance, how to empty out your inbox or how to plan your calendar. And so I think what we're starting to see is the first uh, signals that LLMs are good for some things, but they're not good for all things. And we're going to start to see the emergence of new models, planning models, for example. And then also uh, these models where you've got essentially an ecosystem. You've got LLMs that mm -hmm. do very specific things combined with um, models that do planning and rationalization and prediction. And it's not that these are going to be substituted for each other. In other words, we're not seeing the end of LLMs and the beginning of something else, but rather that the LLMs that are currently being developed will be augmented and arranged with other types of models, which will give them the powers to do other things. And so these ecosystems of models is what a lot of these um, AI companies are starting to think about, starting to figure out how to connect the dots between those things so that these, for example, robotic versions of AI, these AI first robots can start to do things like, well, how do I help you plan your day or how do I predict the day ahead? It's 
super interesting space to be in, Richard. Because you brought it up, I'm going to just touch on a couple of things. So this ecosystem you're talking about, it's called a mixture of experts. And while we were at the conference this week, I got a chance to meet with some of the team members from Liquid AI. And Liquid is a new architecture that's different from the transformer architecture that you see in LLMs that is ideal for what we call time series data. So if you, if you think of just like a drone that's bringing in visual data, Liquid is able to process that on the device, on the edge, a lot better than the LLMs that you'll typically see. But you, you do have so much research happening, as you're saying, in new types of technologies, types of AI. This week itself, you had a new model called Megalodon, and we have previously covered Liquid and the Mambo architectures. And so, yes, it's, it's an exciting time because you're seeing a lot of progress with LLMs, but you're also seeing companies that are starting to think beyond LLMs, what are the limitations? And I will say this, however, there's this concept of emergence when it comes to AI models. As the models get larger, they tend to take on new capabilities. And we have seen the jumps that have been made from GPT-2 to GPT-3, and even GPT-3 to GPT-4. It's yet to be determined what new capabilities may emerge within large language models as we get bigger and more capable. So the jury is out. Maybe it will turn out to be super helpful that we just keep scaling. But the scaling laws is really what we're depending on with LLMs. And for all intents and purposes, it seems like they're going to continue to, to grow and to, to increase in capabilities. Mm -hmm. Well, as a biologist and an evolutionist, I would like to believe that there's some kind of neurodiversity in AI as well, and that yeah. on the fringe of all of these models are going to be a couple of weirdos <laughs> um, that, <laughs> that help us do things that we uh, can't even imagine right now. Exactly. Um, let's get back to robots. Uh, back into Boston, Boston Dynamics announced a new all-electric Atlas robot. Listen, this was the biggest story this week, in my opinion. When it comes to robotics, Boston Dynamics has been the, the king of the hill, right? They have had decades where they have just impressed us. They have inspired us. They have their stretch, their spot, and Atlas robots. And uh, on Wednesday... I remember them posting a video where they were announcing that they were sunsetting Atlas. It was just like a little bit sad and disappointing because I remember seeing Atlas dance. I remember seeing Atlas take its first steps and then just growing and evolving over time. And so it was a bit sad. And I wondered for a but second. You're having feelings for robots already? <laughs> I know, right? I'm getting emotionally connected to, to robots already. <laughs> the anthropomorphic design is working. <laughs> <laughs> so... Boston Dynamics spun out of MIT. Um, it was actually really close to where we were this week. And they got acquired by Hyundai a few years back. And then they started commercializing some of their products like Spot. And we didn't hear a lot about Atlas. Atlas was never commercialized. And so they announced the sunset on Wednesday. But on Thursday, they announced their new humanoid robot. This is Atlas 2. It's all electric and it is amazing um richard did you get a chance to see the demo video what did you think of it yeah the first thing that came to mind is uh if i try to do that my uh <laughs> my joints would explode so yeah those yoga moves were pretty impressive yeah um and so this is where things get really interesting because i started out by saying companies have tried to mimic the human form in robots because the world is designed for humans and so it made sense for them to build robots similarly what Boston Dynamics did was say, sure, we can use the human form factor, but let's improve it. And so you see articulating joints and you need to look at this video in 40 seconds. They basically did a slam dunk on the entire industry. But more importantly, the design of the robot, it's small, it's not bulky, you're not seeing exposed wires. It's super strong and, and it's all electric. So it's not hydraulic based anymore. Um, so very excited to see how this develops. And obviously they're going to be looking to commercialize this. So as they're saying, robots are looking increasingly likely to be household items within the next decade. Yeah, and again, just like connecting back to the anthropomorphic conversation that we're having, you know, if you do look at the human population and the 20% of people that are considered as neurodivergent, 
there are really good examples of how outside of what we think is normal, whatever that is, um, there are lots of fantastic human expressions of both physical and mental and emotional uh, mutations, if you will. I mm -hmm. think that is a fair way to say that. Yeah. That 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 speak to the possibilities. So synesthesia comes to mind. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the, the, the kind of the yoga moves that this this uh, new um, Atlas II robot was performing. Those are not uh, impossible for humans. They're just like definitely on the edge of it. Um, so I, I'd actually imagine that researchers will be seeking out neurodiversity as inspiration. And as you know, I've written about this a bunch of times. Yep, if you yep. are in an innovation group or you're responsible for innovation, one of the things you have to be very, very uh, thoughtful about is seeing human beings as uh, the composite of powers and then thinking which of those powers you can turn into superpowers. So a really good example, a very simple example of this is, you know, if I'm in Spain and I want to know who's at my front door, my vision extends to my ring device that happens to be associated with my home, right? Yep. So basically I'm like Superman. I can see through walls. Yep. And in the same way, these extensions of our senses are no more than just an extension of who we are. And that neurodiversity that we sometimes think of being on the fringe is actually where these things will go to. So think of synesthesia where you can actually hear color or see, uh, you know, music in some form because mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, facilitated by uh, an interconnection of neurons in your brain. Those kinds of things are going to be become the inspiration for uh, for these new uh, developments. And, and I, I'm kind of looking forward to it. I want to see like what the human expression will ultimately look like in the form of robots. Exactly, exactly. Um, some Somewhat associated with what we're talking about, but a little more scary is the idea that DARPA now can fly a fighter jet using AI. Uh, we saw the first dogfight this week. Um, I'm guessing some of that was simulated, some of that was real. Um, where are we going with this? This does feel a little bit uh, dystopian. So I, I wanted to, to bring this to the fore. We have been tracking AI in military and defense for a while now. And uh, like every other industry, AI is going to be increasingly used in the military. It has been in the military for decades now. I think the questions that we'll need to start asking is, well, what should be autonomous and what shouldn't? How do we think about oversight? How do we think about safety? So the, the backstory here is that last year, so this isn't a new story. It's just that DARPA released this information this week on a video. But last September, I believe, they completed the first real-world test. So they had done simulations previously, but you had a real fighter jet pilots against an AI pilot. And they did have a human in the, the plane just in case things went wrong. But the point is, the it's AI was an able expensive to... expensive toy to play with. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, the, the, the point is, the AI was able to successfully complete the training exercise. They didn't specify whether or not the AI won or not. But um, you're increasingly seeing companies like Shield AI and new startups work with the military to bring autonomous capabilities to things like being a pilot. And we, we even heard last week that Frank Kendall, he's the Air Force Secretary, he's going to be flying in an AI-controlled F-16 this year. And so they have a lot of confidence in terms of their capabilities. And in, in, a, in a time when there's so much war happening, I, I do think we'll need to think about where what is the place of AI in safety and defense? Um, is it better to have robots and autonomous systems operating at the edge and managing our safety? And if so, how can we ensure that we ultimately have control and oversight over these systems? Yeah, the two things come to mind. One is uh, wondering why they announced this now. It seems like it might be uh, a signal yep. to, to our enemies or to our adversaries that we have these uh, abilities now. Um, just like drones, of course, that was mm -hmm. a, a strong signal. Um, and then I think the second thing is um, we we shouldn't say that there is so much war now in comparison to the past. In fact, there is less war now than there was in the past. You're and right. a lot of it has to be uh, as a result of deterrence, right? So if we've got this, then you know you probably don't want to start with us. Like we, you know, th that's always been 
uh, a general conversation. So I do see this being more of a deterrent signal than anything like significant right now, because certainly drones can do the work of a fighter pilot right now. It, it feels more to me like a political statement than anything else. I appreciate that correction for the context, because especially for my generation, we didn't see a lot that happened before. And it's so easy to, to lose that perspective. Yeah. So let's um, shift our attention to uh, products. There's some new products that uh, like desktop products, uh, Amazon, Adobe, Thomson Reuters, a lot of the a lot of the players that we've heard of in the past, but maybe just adding additional services and features. Let's talk a little bit about that. Should we start with Adobe? Sure. So what I love about what Adobe announced this week, they they spoke about their new text to video model that's coming to Firefly, um, their family of AI technologies. But they also said that they're bringing in third party models, Sora, Runway, Pika. They're going to be bringing these models into their tools. And this is a big deal. So. I think what Adobe is doing is that they're copying Microsoft's playbook. So here's the thing. I think many companies conflate AI technologies with products. An mm -hmm. AI model is not a product. Unless, of course, you're providing an API like OpenAI. But you see where Microsoft has been able to take OpenAI's technologies and productize them and bring them into the enterprise and drive sales and ensure that they're delivering value to their customers. And I think what Adobe is recognizing, sure, we can go out and invest in building these models and their technologies, but ultimately what we're really good at, we're good at building products, products that enterprise users will love and use and that are already integrated into their systems. And so why don't we leverage these technologies and bring them into our products. And so I, I think it's a brilliant move. You'll be able to access these products to expand your canvas or create B-roll. And I think a lot of creators will embrace this approach to AI versus some chatbot that you put in a prompt and it just generates something for you in, in, in and of itself. If it's a part of your creative flow where in the middle of your creation, you can generate some audio or you can remove a product using AI. I think that's a different conversation for creators. Yeah, two really important things stand out here. I love the fact that you distinguish between product and technology. The, the first thing that comes to mind is that organizations like Adobe, like Microsoft, like Google have massive installed bases mm -hmm. and really they are the portals to the customer experience. Again, where we started this conversation, your talk at uh, Imagination in Action was about how do we actually get this technology to the customer and how mm -hmm. do we build trust so that they can see what it is. Uh, I think the example you used was Spellcheck, where initially Spellcheck was like, hey, we think this is wrong. You know, you might want to check it out. We've kind of put a little line under it, yep. slowly evolved to like, well, here's a suggestion for what it should be or suggestions. Mm -hmm. And then eventually it just became like, well, we're going to correct it for you because you trust us and it's been around for a while. We're starting exactly. to see these organizations take their installed base through those steps, through these kind of trust falls, if you will, mm -hmm. and increasingly provide them with more and more technological advantages. That's the first thing that comes to mind. The second thing is, of course, with with Adobe is ultimately a storytelling platform, right? If you're telling stories with video, with images, um, if you've got some audio in there, if you're doing, you know, the, the kind of the, the work that we've seen in the past. And I, I really truly believe that storytelling is the ultimate human superpower. Yep. We talked a little bit about the anthropomorphic experience. And for me, the ability to take all of the sensory information, turn it into something understandable, and then share that with other people has certainly made us one of the most important species uh, in the history of this planet. <laughs> and I think that if I was um, going to be advising my kids on what to do right now, to be like, get to know these tools uh, and, and you know, really learn your, your storytelling uh, abilities, like figure out how to change um, your idea into a narrative, how to take a story arc and convey that using visuals or audio or a combination of those things. And uh, we've got a we've got a video out from Trip Clemens, who's a filmmaker, um, and that uh, that's a really good example of how we can take storytelling and use these these technologies to amplify those things. I agree. I, I definitely agree. Cool. Uh, Amazon. 
Yeah, so Amazon, this is a, a small update, but you're, it's a pattern that you're starting to see with a lot of these companies. So I think last week or the week before, Spotify announced that their AI DJ, you'd be able to use text prompt to generate a, a playlist. And Amazon is basically replicating it, right? They're saying, if you want to create a playlist, you can use Amazon Maestro and it will generate it. You can use emojis, you can use whatever words that you want. And for me, the big takeaway here, two, two things. One, if you're a startup and you're thinking that I'm just going to come up with a cool feature and, and this is going to be a company, do know that the big players are going to replicate that idea very quickly. Um, yeah. if, if, if it works, they're going to take it. And so you need to have a moat and a, a feature and AI technology is not a moat. The second is that music discovery is a big problem. Despite everything that we have seen, it, it, I miss the old days of radio where mm -hmm. you just be discovering new songs because you're hearing it on the radio. It feels like yeah. a lot of the algorithms we have had over the last decade, they try to take your taste and give you more of that versus saying, this is something completely different, but you should listen to it. And maybe you like it, maybe you don't. And so what I'm hoping is that with natural language coming to these platforms, you'll be able to just describe a feeling or an emotion, and maybe they'll just bring in new songs that allow you to discover content versus just um, putting you in an echo chamber of your own taste. I think this is a really important evolution of technology. We have definitely become myopic because of the way that the algorithms work. They get increasingly better and better at understanding us until, the, you know, we just kind of ignore all of the fringe stuff again, back to neurodiversity. <laughs> yeah. um, we do need that diversity. We need those little, you know, mini uh, discovery moments, those mutations in our life, even when it comes to television and music. YouTube's facing a similar problem. I get to see the same crap over and over again. Exactly. So really what we want to do here is find ways to uh, learn about the customer rather than that particular behavior that we saw, you know, two or three days ago. Um, and that's where prompting comes in. It's like, I can describe what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking, where I want to go, how I'm changing and let that learn with me and explore, you know, explore new things. So I'm kind of looking forward to it. I'm feeling a little bit, um, you know, boxed in by the algorithm right now. Yep. Yep. Cool. Okay. Thomson Reuters, uh, they've decided to expand service to legal and tax professionals. Is yes. That's the first time I've heard this. I've heard actually a couple of legal stories of the last week. What's going on in that space? The story here is that they acquired a company called Case Text last summer. It's an AI legal assistant that was powered by GPT-4. Mm -hmm. And they had, I think, 100,000 law firms and legal departments within their portfolio at the time. And they acquired them for, I think, half a billion dollars in cash. And since then, they have decided that they're going to move away from just focusing on law. They're going to just expand this to being a general purpose, professional grade AI assistant for knowledge workers and across all verticals. So they're going to slowly teach it different skills. And I, I think one thing that stands out here is proprietary data is going to be a massive advantage for companies. Yeah. For companies like Thomson Reuters that can take that data and they can build custom models or fine tune a model based on that data, that's going to give them definitely a competitive advantage over other companies that may just have a generic model that they're trying to apply to the, to the same domain. And so kudos to them for being ambitious, for pushing their solution. I think a lot of their customers and clients, they're rolling it out in the UK, I believe initially, but a lot of their, their customers are going to enjoy this. And, and to your point, over the last week, we have seen at least three different AI startups, um, some in the UK, actually, that have been raising money. And so law and legal affairs is a domain where I think AI has had missteps in the past, but you're definitely seeing a need for AI solutions to help with aggregating data, synthesizing data, and um, doing a lot of referencing. So yeah. expect to see a lot more progress in this space. And I think in general, uh, anybody who's sitting on data, uh, one of my clients, Crystal, sits on about 300 million profiles that have been registered and verified. Um, the question that we've been asking, of course, is that how do you make that useful to the audience and 
working on a pre-meeting intelligence product, which is really interesting, which ah. actually looks to your calendar to see who you're going to meet and then bubbles up a dossier or a report on the individuals that you're going to be meeting with so that you've got insight into the meeting, the person you're going to meet with, gives you confidence, raises the opportunity for success in that meeting, and ultimately makes for a better interaction between human beings. So there's a really good example of take data, combine it with AI, deliver it in a way that helps the person feel more human as opposed to replace them. Brilliant. So we're not saying, hey, AI is going to do your meeting for you. What we're saying is you can even be better prepared and feel like you have greater confidence in every single meeting because of this data and because of what AI can do for you uh, embedded in your in your calendar. So really kind of fun stuff there. I'm looking forward to seeing like more of these data-driven opportunities where you're sitting on a lake of data, we're sitting on tons of data, but we really haven't seen the value from big data, have we? We have exactly. just way too much data, especially on the government side, you know, taxes, things like that. How do we turn that into valuable insights that we can use every single day? I love that that's the approach that you're taking because I think I, I talk about this, that SaaS is dead. They just haven't realized it yet. I, I think for the last decade, we have seen this push to build more tools. I need a new calendar. I need a new task management system. And uh, no, the evolution is somebody's not looking for a pickaxe. They're not looking for a tool. They're looking for value. And mm -hmm. so what you're saying that Crystal is doing it. It's not saying, hey, here's a new calendaring tool that will allow you to do things. It's going in, it's doing research on your behalf. And it's saying, hey, here's some value that you can get with this solution. Yeah. And I think what's really interesting, you talk about value, is that um, we've calculated that for the cost of about 1% of a deal closing. In other words, let's say you close a $100,000 million, $100, deal. Yeah. Um, you know, you're a B2B salesperson. Uh, for one percent of the cost of that, you can actually increase <laughs> the opportunity to close that deal significantly. Um, and I, over time, we'll find out exactly what that is. But it's so amazing that these oh. small investments can have such a huge impact on the outcomes. Exactly. Uh, cool. Let's turn our attention to models. We've talked a lot about you know LLMs. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what's going on. Three new stories specifically from Meta this week. Yeah. So. Everybody in the AI space is talking about Llama 3. Llama 3 is the third generation of Meta's large language models. It is amazing. That's, that's the only way I can, I can put it. But what makes Meta stand out in the AI space is that they released open weight models, meaning anybody can take the model and use it in their production. Um, it's not like a GPT-4 or a Claude or a Gemini where it's, owned by these companies and you need to pay them and, and go through them. If you want to run Llama on your own infrastructure, um, you can. If you, if you want to run it on your own PC or Mac, you can. I, I wrote an article yesterday where I provide instructions. So if, if, if you're thinking, hey, I don't want to sign up for ChatGPT, here's the thing. Llama 3 is as capable and actually more capable than GPT 3.5, which is a free version of ChatGPT. And so if you're using the free version of ChatGPT, you may as well just run Llama 3 on your own computer. One, it will be private and you'll be able to keep all your, your requests local. Um, you won't need an internet connection for it to run. As long as you have a computer that's capable enough to run it, you'll be able to do that. But if you're a business and you're thinking, hey, we don't want to be locked into a vendor, Llama 3 is going to be a very capable model that will, will help you to do this. So here's the, the lowdown on it. When it comes to the benchmarks, it beats most of the models. It, it beats so the next generation of um, Gemini 1.5 that Google hasn't even released fully yet. And that says a lot because if you think of all the effort that Google has put in behind their Gemini models and the fact that you now have an open weights model that is doing that is incredible. It's able to match, I believe, Claude Sonnet and it's, it's very comparable to GPT-4. In fact, Elon Musk saw the model and he actually said it was impressive. And he has been very critical of a lot of different models, but coming out with Llama 3, I think Mark Zuckerberg and his team have made a very bold statement. They have released two versions of the model, the 7 billion and I, I believe the 80 billion parameter versions. 
and they're going to be releasing a much larger version, but also multimodal models, multilingual models. Um, so they have a lot of updates that they're going to be releasing this year. But very exciting to see this. If you want to try it out, you can use Llama 3 No in any of the meta apps. So if you're using Instagram, if you're using WhatsApp, if you're using Facebook Messenger in that bar at the top, if you search, you can use Meta AI and the Meta AI Assistant is using Llama 3. And for the first time, Meta has also created a standalone web experience. So if you go to, I believe, meta.ai, you'll get a chatbot experience just like ChatGPT and you'll be able to use Llama 3 there. So again, it's free. It is open weights. You can do with this what you want. Um, and it's very competitive with the leading large language models on the market today. All of what you've just discussed is available on the imaginative website. So if you want instructions or you want to know more about any of the stories that we've been telling, uh, check that out. Um, probably one of the most fun stories that we can talk about this week is VASA. Um, now, robotics, anthropomorphic, experiences <laughs> one of the problems with anthropomorphic experiences is the uncanny uncanny valley right so when things are too uh approximate to the human experience and we can discern that they are not exactly human we have almost like a repulsion to that but we're now <laughs> entering into a new era where it's becoming increasingly more difficult to distinguish uh I, as you said in your talk on um on thursday i don't think that means that we won't evolve the ability to distinguish but right now vasa looks pretty damn interesting <laughs> tell us more about that it, it does feel like we're we're coming out of the valley and we're ascending the the other side of the mountain right um yeah. it's so vasa is a new model from microsoft and uh, what it does simply put you can take one photo and an audio file and that photo becomes a talking head video the only way for you to appreciate this, if you haven't seen it already, is to just watch the demo. Go to the Imaginative website, search for Vasa, and watch a demo. And they they have so many different examples where it's the detail of the lip sync, the eye movements, the micro expressions on their faces as these photos begin talking. Have you ever had, maybe you're in that place right now where you want to turn your life around and you know somewhere deep in your soul there could be some decisions that you have to make. Like, you know, like it's like things, something was decided for you. And instead of trying to make something that is done work, it's like the invitation is to make the decision, commit to that and to start creating what comes next. But here's the thing. When we say no to something, we're saying yes to something else. It's, it's incredible. And it, you can use, an actual photo of someone, but you can also use pictures and generated content and synthetic media. And so there's an example of the Mona Lisa um, doing a rap. And it, it's just it's, it's just like, you look at it and you're like, wow, think of the, the creative possibilities that come to mind now when anything that you see could just start talking, like a picture that you'd have on the wall could all of a sudden just start talking. That That's just incredible. And <laughs> I was going to say the immediate thing that came to mind was uh, in those humanoid robots, like we've seen from like Atlas 2, there is a uh, an area on the head which could easily be a screen, um, like a 3D screen. And you could have it take a photograph of you and then mimic you. And that would also be like an incredible experience is to have you know, a, a clone of yourself doing things around the house, operating like, you know, a husband, a dad, a mom, <laughs> whatever, a secondary. And I've always kind of wished that I had a clone to go and do, you know, yard work and, and do stuff like that. <laughs> you know, it's it's funny because when when I saw it, I immediately thought of Harry Potter. And when you'd see those photos that would suddenly start talking to you and moving, and yeah, the portraits in the in in Hogwarts. Yeah. Exactly, <laughs> and and one other thing that is interesting, you you see a lot of this in AI research out of China and Japan, where they have an aging population, and you're seeing where people are exploring ways in which they can capture moments and memories of their parents and their grandparents, 
And of course you can clone their voices and maybe they have a diary. And so all of a sudden you can get this context of who they were and what they would think about certain things. And you can interact with them after they're gone. And that's a whole different conversation, but you're starting to see where this technology is definitely going to raise a lot of ethical questions, but it's also going to change us as like as a society, but maybe also the species as we start figuring out the boundaries of how we interact with what is real, what is synthetic, what is just real time and what is generated. I mean, personally, I have a, I have an, a kind of a, a real desire for this. I've got, you know, a situation where, um, you know, I lost my wife a couple of years ago. And I'd love my son to grow up recognizing and maybe having some kind of interaction with Christie's face of oh. voice, you know, and, and recreating some of the things that we weren't able to recreate. And at wow. the same time, I've got aging parents. <clears throat> They've got boxes full of photographs and images and stories of people that have preceded us, our, our ancestors and our, our grandparents, etc. And I'd love to kind of archive that in a way so that James, my eight-year-old, can grow up recognizing and understanding their stories, their narratives, and make them part of his experience. And I, you know, not to get too philosophical here, but there's an element of this which brings the eternal now conversation yes. back into focus, which is yes. everything that we really are is happening right now. There is no past, there's no future, there's just like a recognition of those things. And so bringing them in, certainly there's a boundary to this, an ethical consideration, but there's also a reality which is like can we have everything that we imagined in our past imagined in our future happening right now well wow. <laughs> that's just incredible thank yeah. you richard for sharing that yeah um okay so another conversation specifically around uh like new and crazy interesting startups is reka is that the way they pronounce it R E K A. I am pronouncing it reka <laughs> yeah uh, tell us about Reka. Sure. So this is an AI startup out of California. And last December, I believe they released their Reka Edge and Reka Flash models. And this week they announced Reka Core. And here's the, the question that I think companies will need to ask, startups will need to ask. I compared the benchmarks, right, between the new Llama 3. And again, Llama 3 is open weights for all in intents and purposes. It's basically free for anyone to use. Yeah. Llama 3 beats Reka Core on basically every benchmark. It, it mm. didn't beat it on one that I saw and it was like by one point, like one percentage mm. point, which, which is nothing. I'm sure Reka is multimodal, but we have heard from Mark Zuckerberg that Llama 3 will be multimodal. They have a much bigger model that they're going to be releasing. So their next version is going to be even more capable. And, and so you'll need to start asking like, is it worth building your own model? They're going to be increasingly expensive to build. And companies like Meta have the resources where they can put billions into these models. But if you're a startup and you're saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to build a model, you'll need to differentiate yourself very quickly and in very unique ways in order for you to stay relevant. And so it, it, it was almost a shame because when they made their update earlier in the week, it was like, oh, this is amazing news. And then the next day, boom, Llama 3 comes out and obsolete. Well, we're in that, uh, we're in that uh, divergent phase of an industry where there are lots of new entries into the market, and that's normal. Um, you go back to the beginning of the 1900s when there were something like 15 or 1600 different car manufacturers. Over time, those got consolidated. In fact, uh, here's a little bit of trivia for you. The Audi symbol, that is the four interlocking rings, mm -hmm. that actually represents four companies that they merged together. Oh, um, wow. I didn't know yeah, that. Uh, Daimler, uh, you know, Daimler and Benz came together. Daimler Chrysler came together. Fiat is actually the owner of Ferrari, um, Maserati, Alfa. I think I'm missing one. But, you know, a lot of these companies will start to acquire these technologies if they think they're relevant or mm -hmm. useful. And so it is good to have a divergent phase in any new market because we need that neurodiversity, that ex that expansion of different ideas. But over time, it's pretty normal for some consolidation to happen um, and then it'll be convergent for a while. So, yeah, I think um, we're going to start seeing that kind of bubble shape itself right now where we're going to see companies starting to either be acquired as we saw with um, 
sort of yeah. acqui hire, if you will. Um, but there's lots of those kind of examples where the 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 diversity, which is great, needs to eventually become accessible by the consumer, by the end user. Great. Uh, Chips, you want to talk about infrastructure? Sure, I'll, I'll talk about this briefly because we're, we're running late and, and there are some business updates that I definitely want to touch on. But basically, AMD revealed new chips for their Pro 8000 series. And these are going to be edge-based chips that are focusing on the emerging AI PC market. And we have spoken about this over the last couple of weeks. You have a lot of players in the chip space and they're operating at different layers. You have those at the data center that are going to be your NVIDIA's and their Blackwell chips, their popular H100s, et cetera. You have chips that are going to be at the edge that are going to be on your mobile devices, on your computers. And in the, um, in the drone, in the, in the humanoid robots, <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. And so this is this is basically a continuation of that. Really good chips coming out of AMD. And then I, I think what we're seeing from Linux that I wanted to touch on, they are expanding and, and promoting their open platform for enterprise AI. And I, I think the concern that they have is that a lot of the growth that you're seeing today in AI is founded on. A lot of closed proprietary solutions coming out of NVIDIA, CoreWeave, and a, a couple of different companies. And if you think historically, a lot of computing technology was built on open source. And so right. they're promoting a new open source framework. We have seen Intel and IBM and other companies join other initiatives to promote open source data centers. And so Linux is, is just promoting a new open platform for enterprise. And it's an entire software stack that companies will be able to get behind. Cool. Let's uh, jump to those business updates. Sure. So business-wise, there are a couple of important things that happened this week. And so many companies raised money. We won't even get a chance to touch on them. If you want to look at startups that are raising funding, hop on over to imaginative.com. You'll see some great stories from this week. But the first story I want to touch on is Stability AI. We spoke about the fact that a few weeks ago, Imad Mustak resigned as the CEO of Stability AI. And we knew they were burning through a lot of cash each month. And now the new interim co-CEOs have announced that they're cutting 10% of the staff. And again, as I just said, technology is not a product. And so with Stability AI, they're still promoting a lot of their models. However, I think they need to accelerate that product market fit. They need to ensure that they're getting customers and think of a way in which they can operate this as a business and not just really cool, innovative technology. Again, lots of diversity, lots of cool stuff, but uh, very difficult to see that applied to the market um until we get product market fit a really interesting story is the harper collins story we've spoken about content and ai coming together this is another good example of that isn't it it is 11 labs reached out to us they, they mentioned that they were going to be partnering with harper collins and what they're doing is that they're using 11 labs ai voice technology to create audiobooks in foreign languages for a lot of publishers. And I think this is a big deal because oftentimes we think of AI just replacing voice actors. Um, the reality is that a lot of content doesn't reach the majority of people because it's within a certain language. And so no, if you have a book that's available in maybe five languages, using 11 labs technology you can have it available in like 25 languages very quickly very easily and in a very realistic sounding voice so i think this is a major opportunity for publishers like harper collins to bring more functionality and capabilities to their the authors that they represent in fact i was talking to an author this week and she was saying she's about to record her audio for her book that she just released and then she'd be starting her tour later this year and i'm excited to read her book but she i, I suggested hey why don't you use ai and she was thinking about it because it's an ai focused book of course but she she also wanted to personally record that that audio and so i get that authors will still want to have that ownership but to be able to maybe professionally clone your voice and then dub it in a different language, that's the, the power that Eleven Labs will bring to the table. Yeah, and that as, a, as an author myself, um, having published books, that's the thing that came to my mind is um, 
could I take this voice, record 30 seconds or you know more as a, a model for the AI to then replicate and then take those books and also maybe do it in other languages. Uh, you know, yep. we've already published uh, product leadership in 16 languages. Uh, that's made a big difference to the footprint that mm -hmm. the book has uh, been able to establish worldwide. Um, but yeah, all of these tools are the kind of things that we always want. You know, if you have a voice, if you're writing, if you're speaking, if you're publishing, these are the tools that kind of accelerate the opportunities. Exactly. Uh, last story. So two stories I'll touch on here. One, OpenAI is expanding to Tokyo. And we're, we're seeing this slow creep from OpenAI and Microsoft. In fact, I believe it was last week or the week before that Microsoft opened a new research office in Japan. And we're now seeing where OpenAI is following suit. We, we see where sovereign AI is going to become increasingly important to, to countries. And I, I think what OpenAI is doing is being very strategic. They're in London. They're, I believe they're in Ireland. They're in Tokyo, you know, being able to work with countries to build local models. That's going to be increasingly important. We saw Spain is going to be working with IBM to, to build models in not just Spanish, but also languages like Catalan and Basque. Um, and so here you're seeing where Japan is also going to be working with OpenAI to build out models and increase investment in infrastructure, et cetera. Nice. The, the last story is going to be from Microsoft investing in G42. And for some context, G42 is based in the UAE. They have released the largest Arabic open source model. It came out last year. It was really well done. People loved it and it has evolved a lot since. But G42 is going to be no getting a $1.5 billion investment from Microsoft. But there is also a big geopolitical context to understand here. With this investment, they're also going to be moving away from their ties to China. And Brad Smith they, from Microsoft was there to sign that deal. And apparently the U.S. government was pivotal in ushering in this deal. And so, yes, you're just seeing Microsoft being the one to make the announcement, but there's a massive geopolitical angle that's happening where there's a Cold War happening right now between the U.S. and sure. China, right? Especially our own chips and AI chip technology and them making moves like this where Microsoft is now going to have a minority stake in G42. G42 is going to be driving all of the AI models in the Middle East. That's that's what that looks like in on the ground. Yeah, it, it reminds me of the movie Oppenheimer, where it's not really about the bomb. It's about the future of the Cold War. I think a lot of these questions about making investments with partners in these, as you said, key geopolitical locations. Um, it's more about the future of the Cold War or the information war or the AI war that's coming uh, versus these specific tools or infrastructure investments. Exactly. Exactly. And and that's it for the week. There were so many more stories that we didn't get a chance to cover because one, we were in Boston at the conference that we'll be adding to the, the site this weekend. But there are stories on the website that we didn't even touch on in this call. And that's this, the story every week. So you know the drill. Head on over to imaginative.com to check out all the stories. If you want, subscribe to the newsletters there. We have a paid tier where if you subscribe there, you'll get additional information. And you'll also support the work that we're doing. Right here on YouTube, if you want to get notified when we release a new video, just hit the like and subscribe button. And we launched our new podcast last week. We're going to have an amazing episode coming up this week that I think everyone is going to absolutely love. So if you want to hear more, check out Imagine This, Imagine That on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, and also on YouTube. But with that, Richard, any final thoughts? No, uh, lovely seeing you in person. Hope we hope we can do it again soon. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to another big week next week. Awesome. Well, enjoy the weekend, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. One love.